What is a little bombshell your therapist dropped in one of your sessions that completely changed your outlook? Story 1. Stop trying to get everyone to agree. When you need everyone to agree, the least agreeable person has all the power. Story 2. How was anger expressed in your household growing up? Were you allowed to show anger? At which point I realized I wasn't allowed to show any negative emotions whatsoever, especially not in reaction to negative emotions from my parents. Story 3. My therapist traced me on a big piece of paper so I could see how big small I was. I thought him and I were about the same size. I got him to lay on top of the paper and I disappeared. Seeing my size that way made my brain begin to think differently. It helped me realize I was not fat. At 5, 2, and 110 PDs, I needed to realize that. Years of bullying fucks with one's brain. Story 4. When you use the words, I should, you're silently finishing the sentence with, in order to be worthy of love and respect. Should is a much smaller part of my vocabulary now. Story 5. Is it your anxiety or hers? Background. I have an overbearing mother who needs to know as much as she can about what I'm doing on my own time to sleep well at night, according to her. She basically treats me like a rebellious kid in a teen movie from the 90s, when I'm an independent grown-ass woman approaching my mid-30s. At the time my therapist said this, I was 28-ish and panicking about an upcoming business trip. Not the trip itself, but her reaction to me leaving the state for a few days. As I was going down the list of texts I knew she'd bombard me with, my therapist dropped this. She gave me permission to opt out of managing her fears like I had been doing for years. End result, I went on the trip without telling her a thing and have established a few more sanity-preserving boundaries since. Story 6. Don't think of the relationship as over. Think of it as complete. Fundamentally changed how I was processing a tough breakup. So helpful. Story 7. My counselor said to imagine myself as an orange. Then, consider that not all people like oranges. That doesn't mean that the orange is flawed in any way, not rotten, just that everyone has preferences. That helped ease my insecurities and need for people pleasing dramatically. Story 8. At the time, I was into getting tarot card readings and seeing psychics. My therapist told me he has psychic clients who come to him ashamed about the excessive amount of lying they do every day. Haven't been to a psychic or tarot card reader since. Story 9. I don't want to take meds because I don't want to rely on drugs to feel okay. Don't you already do that? My therapist in the session before I finally saw a psychiatrist and got officially diagnosed with bipolar 2. I was heavily self-medicating at the time, but of course didn't see it that way because it wasn't a prescription. Story 10. Your mother was an absentee mother. So why would you think she would be anything other than an absentee grandmother to your child? It made me lower expectations of the type of relationship my child would have with my mom. So now she's the fun grandma on FaceTime that sends presents but never shows up and I'm perfectly okay with that. Story 11. Your mom is never going to be the parent you want or need, so stop expecting her to be and being mad that she isn't. Also, people who are addicts tend to get frozen at the time they started abusing drugs or alcohol because their focus is their addiction and not developing as a person. So a person who started drinking heavily at 13 and quit at 30 would behave a lot like a 13-year-old. Story 12. They literally do not give a shit about you, so why do you care about them? letting me know it was time to move forward from some hurt that I held onto for a long time and understand vindication and atonement doesn't always come. Story 13. First session, going over history, talking about how sad I am and how it affects my marriage. And after describing our relationship, the counselor said, wow, you're really going through a lot of mental and emotional abuse. What? Honestly, I didn't know it was a thing. She was right. It took me a few years, but I was able to get out. Story 14. Will worrying about it change the outcome? If the answer is yes, go ahead and worry about it. I suddenly realized that I couldn't think of a situation where the answer to that question was ever yes. Really short-circuited the worry cycle for me. Story 15, you are not special. I was having some very strong anxiety at the time, especially in regards to other people. I felt like I was judged everywhere, like I couldn't go to the store, take the bus, or even go to a walk because I felt people were judging my every move, how I dressed, how was my hair, how I talked, even how I walked. Every stranger was thinking bad of me. It was scary as hell. I was telling her about this and how I started avoiding going out, which was a problem because I had to go to college soon. And she looked me straight in the eyes and told me, name, I'm telling you this with all the care of the world, but you are not special. There is nothing that would make me think twice if we crossed in the street, is harsh and is exactly what I needed. 
All the anxiety didn't let me see that until she said it. But see, she helped me some other ways, but this really, really changed my life when she said it. I could go to college and be out because of it. Story 16. There's nothing wrong with you. You are just picking the wrong people to be friends with. I got some new friends and my life changed pretty dramatically after that. Story 17. You are not responsible for your parents' emotional well-being. They are independent adults who have been on this earth for many more years than you. Story 18. I used to say a lot of things I wanted to do and then follow up with, but it's hard. My therapist asked me one time how it would feel to say what I wanted to do and then say, and it's hard. I can't believe I hadn't considered that myself in four decades. But man, did it change my mindset on certain things. Story 19. I wanted to reach out to my ex. My therapist said, you're feeling a loss of security because your family is moving away from your city. Don't reach out. So insightful. I didn't reach out and I'm better for it. Story 20. That being selfish is okay, but being self-centered isn't. Being selfish is recognizing your needs and taking care of yourself, but being self-centered is ignoring everyone else. Oh, another one that a commenter reminded me about. Moat men only know two emotions happy and angry because we're told that's all we can feel. That sometimes your body and mind are reacting with anger, but that's not what you're feeling. In those moments, you need to take a break and ask what emotion you're feeling. I still struggle with this one. Story 21. When I started to realize I was transgender, I was really afraid of taking hormones. A lot of people had tried to scare me into not medically transitioning, claiming it was dangerous or would ruin my body. My therapist asked me to make a pros and cons list about taking hormones and also do the pros and cons of not taking hormones because not medically transitioning is also a choice that will affect you. It helped me realize that all the things I was afraid of were fear-mongering and not actual side effects. I started HRT a few months later, and it literally saved my life. Story 22. He helped me understand grief in others better, that it was my own anxiety that made me want to fix and improve things for them. Instead, I should just follow them on that ride and listen. Story 23. You may just be graduating high school and you're going to be a legal adult, but you're just a kid. It's not your responsibility to take care of everyone. It was never your responsibility. Because at the end of the day, you were just a kid wondering why you had to be the marriage counselor and shielding your brother from everything. I didn't know how much I needed to be reminded how I was a kid until that moment. It made sense, though, on why I often feel like time went by too fast and I didn't get to enjoy being a teen in high school because I was too busy being an adult when it was never my responsibility. Story 24 you have the most profound history of trauma I've worked with in my entire career. My lifelong feelings of self-doubt, being dramatic or overreacting or misremembering and downplaying abuse just melted. My brain attempted to comprehend the severity of my PTSD for the first time rather than just making another joke about it. I was called out on a level of denial that was so deeply a part of me I didn't know who I was without it. Story 25 you can't have true emotional vulnerability with others until you can learn to have emotional vulnerability with yourself. I'm having some issues connecting with people in my life, but really it's because I deny and shove down my own emotions so effectively that I don't even know myself. Story 26. Wow, your mother was is really a terrible person. My younger siblings have come to this conclusion a long time ago without therapy, but for some reason with me being the oldest, I can't hate her although I have valid reasons to. She neglected my sister and I and basically forced me to raise two small children starting at age eight because she wasn't physically or emotionally available to do so. She is now a full-blown narcissist alcoholic, and I look back and see how she was emotionally manipulative and abusive, so my therapist is right in her conclusion. I just never could see her that way because she was my mom at the end of the day. Story 27. That negative self-talk is just a part of you trying to help that needs some translation first. Like if I'm sitting there watching my fifth hour of TV and I keep hearing thoughts in my head about how I'm such a lazy piece of shit, then I need to translate that into the intention, which is that it is probably a good idea to stop and do something else now. Now I can think about the negative self-talk as being on the same team and wanting the best for me. Whereas before I spent a lot of time first trying to ignore negative intrusive thoughts, then tried radical acceptance, then tried mindfulness techniques to quiet them, but nothing really worked and I continued to find them distressing. But now, I can just stop and think, what is this negative thought really about? And what is it really trying to tell me? So I end up reflecting more than average, and once I translate the thought, I understand it and find it less troubling. Story 28. Were you ever allowed to feel your feelings? Nope. Turns out my mom is a master gaslighter. Mom, I'm sad. No, you're not, you're just tired. Mom, this makes me really happy. No, it doesn't. You are just overstimulated. 
Mom, I feel bad when you treat me like this. No, you don't. You just have been manipulated by your friends to rebel. I was never allowed to express slash understand slash feel my feelings without my mom telling me what I really felt and why. As an adult, I had to understand, learn all her programming and relearn how to identify my feelings after my psychiatrist pointed out my lack of understanding. Story 29. That there was nothing wrong with me and I didn't need fixing. Turns out being asexual is a perfectly legit choice. Considering I have supported and voted in favor of LGBTQ laws for protecting their rights my whole life, I was still surprised that I was actually part of that cohort. Took 32 years and a year of therapy for it to occur to me. Story 30. After a three-year battle with Alzheimer's and having weird meth smoker move into her garage to help her and my disabled sister, while I was in and out of hospitals with my four-yo daughter having multiple brain surgeries, burying my mom, closing her estate while having to then move my three kids and two cats to another city and sell my old home and buy a new home. And I thought, Jesus fucking Christ, will this absolute madness ever end? And I was so stressed, trauma brain, so sad at how my mom was being abused by my sister and the meth AH, and I was barely holding on to my sanity. I sat with my therapist telling her all this crazy bullshit sandwich I had to eat while trying to be fully there for my daughter and how I lived 50 miles away from my mom but visited weekly to make sure she was okay. I said I'm so filled with so much bitterness, I can't even leave my house. I feel stuck in this place. It was a whole year in my new town, my new house, and I was stuck in the past. She said bitterness is sadness plus anger. Break those down and it's easier to forgive yourself for all that you're angry about and allow yourself to grow. That helped me so much. And EMDR therapy. Story 31. I've never really had friends. I've had colleagues and classmates and housemates and people who have hung out with me, but I never really felt close to any of them. And I did that thing you see on here sometimes. I stopped reaching out to see if I would be reached out to, and I wasn't, which I took as confirmation that they didn't really want me around, or at the very least, that they wouldn't mind my absence. I was talking to my therapist about people I'd been close to in college, and she told me to pick one and talk about him. So I did. And after I shared some basic stuff like his name and his major, etc., and a couple anecdotes, she asked me what else I knew about him, and I couldn't answer. It wasn't really a broadly applicable bombshell, but she said, what else? And I started crying because I realized that for as simple as the question was, my inability to answer spoke volumes. I've never had good friends because I've never been a good friend. I'm withdrawn and reserved, and I always made others do the work to drag me out without ever extending my own friendship in a meaningful way in return. If I wanted to have meaningful relationships with other people, I would have to build them. I'm still working on this, but I'm trying to make more offers and extend more friendliness to others in my daily life. Story 32. You always talk about not wanting to do to your daughters what your mom did to you. You worry about it so much in every interaction you have ever had with them. But your children are 19 and 21 now. They are happy and healthy, and they trust you because you've never abused them in any way. So I just want to validate for you that you really have broken that cycle of violence. You did that, and you should be proud of it. I'm proud of you for it. Story 33. I don't work as a therapist. I'm an ESL, English as a Second Language teacher in Japan. But my classes are one-on-one, -on -one, so I do spend a lot of time on consultation and personal conversations. Something I said to a client once seemed to really change his outlook. A lot of my company's clients are focused on learning English for international business, and this man, as many of them are, was concerned about making mistakes and looking like a fool. I asked him if the English speakers he works with sometimes try to speak Japanese, and he said that they do. I asked him if they ever make mistakes, and he said that they do. I asked him to name one, and he couldn't, and I told him that his mistakes will be forgotten too. Story 34. I was having non-stop panic attacks and derealization that lasted a month. It was like my brain was stuck in panic mode. I decided to find a therapist. In our first session, she said, you know you don't have to suffer, right? Meaning I should schedule an appointment with a psychiatrist and get on medication. I scheduled one ASAP and it truly saved my life. I don't know what I had been waiting for or delaying. Story 35. When they mentioned that they felt I was a clear example of CPTSD, I instantly felt ashamed because that's what people get after going to war. No way I could have that. You experienced battles every day of your life and you have seen extreme violence on the regular. It may not be a countrywide war, but you experienced your own wars. I was like, well, goddamn. It keeps me going, knowing I don't deal with those wars anymore. Story 36. How my dad did his best against adversity. I used to be angry at him for not doing certain things, but I really didn't take the time to see it from his perspective. 
Story 37. You can't expect everyone to get it when you have been doing it for 25 years and they have been doing it for a month. Expect less from them. It's so obvious, but for me, I just could not see it. Story 38. That just because I didn't kick or punch or scream or come away bruised and battered doesn't mean it wasn't rape. Story 39. My therapist kept talking about her life. She was married, had three kids and four cats. She was often seen with cat hair on clothes. She responded with, Cat hair is like glitter for lonely people. I switched therapists. Story 40. Wow. I was talking about my mother's behavior through my life and my upbringing in general. I often use it as a joke that I made my therapist say this. However, she followed it up by telling me that, considering all that had happened and the stuff I had been through, I was doing really well in life. I shouldn't be so hard on myself and needed to focus more on my positive achievements rather than letting my remaining flaws hold my focus. It's a moment I keep coming back to. It was also very cathartic to have a professional pretty much agree that my past life was nuts. Story 41. After I beat up my middle school bully, my therapist congratulated me for standing up for myself. I thought she would chastise me like every other adult in my life, but she was encouraging. Obviously, she told me that violence like that wasn't the best way to handle it, but that making a stand was important either way. No one had ever told me that it was okay. I always got a lecture about not acknowledging bullies and telling the teacher instead, but we all know that never works. Having an adult validate me, even if I wasn't entirely right, was a huge boost. Story 42. He was a good dad but a bad husband. But he wasn't your husband. It wasn't your job to fix that marriage. Parents hated each other. Broke up. Always besties with my dad, but was mostly raised by mum due to financial difficulties. Love mum too, so was pulled between them. Spent my entire childhood hearing how shit he was. When to me, he was always open and loving with my issues without judgment. My counselor said this to me and it changed my whole world view. It wasn't and never will be my job to have fixed that shit show of a marriage. He was a good dad and that's all that mattered. Story 43. It is tough to deal with my situation, isn't it? Made me acknowledge that PTSD was a challenge and to move forward with addressing it rather than ignoring it and self-medicating. Story 44. Just because the stress you're feeling isn't as bad as the stress you had in childhood doesn't mean it's not stress. I was am seeing a therapist to talk about how I have depression despite not facing any major challenges and not being stressed about anything. I couldn't figure out why I never had the energy to get out of bed. Turns out it's because I was unable to identify and process stress. Story 45. Um, okay, I just asked you a pretty easy question. And you went on a tangent trying to find your way to the answer. Next time, let's try to focus on just answering directly so I can follow up. Changed my outlook on her role as my therapist. That was the last time I talked to her. Story 46. I was constantly bringing up how I felt like a completely different person after my mom died. Like there was a, a marked difference between before and after her death. But once she was asking about my hobbies, I got really into describing all the things I love to do or at least used to do before I got into a deep depression. She was like, wow, you seem very passionate. And I just sat there like, well, I mean, I can't change what I like to do. They're still fun to do. And it's like she knew when to take a step back because it was like, wow, I may be super depressed about my mom passing, but I'm still me. I'm still my passions and those don't go away. IDK, maybe it only makes sense to be, but it really started getting me back on track. Story 47. For context, I had a major TBI, seizures, strokes, and all around not a fun brain time when I was 28. You have to grieve the loss of yourself. Most people wanted me to go back to how I was. The fucked up truth is that part of my brain is dead. The person everyone, including myself, knew died. I needed to grieve the loss of myself. Story 48. That crying can be a form of manipulation. I'm a crier and it never occurred to me. But duh. Now I try very hard to hold these tears in. I cry when I'm happy, sad, mad. IDKY. I've always hated it about myself and now I hate it even more. But I do actively try. Story 49. I told my therapist I didn't feel like I could talk to him anymore, and he spent 45 minutes berating me. He mocked me twice. Story 50. That maybe I am not the only one in my family who is dealing with mental illness. They might be dealing with it too. The whole time I felt I was the odd one out, the only one who had problems like that, and that had to take meds. Story 51. He said, Claim the right to your space in the world. My self-esteem and self-worth was non-existent. I didn't believe I deserved the oxygen I was breathing. He was saying that being a person, being born, gives you the right to exist. You don't have to earn it. You're here. Claim your space. Story 52. 
Is it really your shame to carry? I take on others' feelings too much, being a people pleaser. So that is a question I still ask myself sometimes when I feel shame. Story 53. Not related, but thank you OP for asking this question. This has been insightful and the best Reddit post I have ever seen after using this app for eight years. Thank you. Story 54. Why do you think you're lazy? Then she listed off all the things she knows I'm doing for my family, my job, and my life. It kind of blew my mind when I struggled to come up with an example. She also described family dysfunction as water. Some families are messed up in a way that everyone can see the huge waves across the surface. Others are better at hiding it, but there's still a riptide that you can't see unless you're also in the water. Made me realize that trying to keep the surface from ever rippling doesn't erase what is happening underneath. Story 55. He put down his pencil in the middle of one of my stories and exhaled. He said, that is a lot. I'd told the same story a few times matter-of-factly and never considered how bad it was. Story 56. Anger is a blocked wish. Whenever you're angry, try to find the wish that you can't reach and then try to come up with a plan to reach it. Story 57. What do you like to do for fun? Like, really like? And then I sat there, staring for some seconds because the answer was, I don't know. Saying this, and coming to terms with the fact that depression and a toxic relationship had dragged me this far was hard. Story 58. You did the best you could, using the tools you'd learned about me using alcohol as a way to cope after growing up with an alcoholic mother. And you've always needed a reason to dislike someone. That's why it hurts when someone dislikes you, but not everyone else has a reason. Story 59. What if that is just how and who you are? I'm a chaotic night owl. I'm always punishing myself for being the one that works at 2 a.m. and wakes up at 11 a.m. And my day starts shit because I punish myself for not holding on to the 8 a.m. wake up because it's edged into my brain that it's not how I'm supposed to do things. My mom is still trying to convince me that what I'm doing is unhealthy. Nevertheless, she's the one on a whole pharmacy of drugs for her depression because she can't accept who she is. Story 60. It was my first session with the lady therapist. Almost in the middle or towards the end of the session, she dropped this. Your source of happiness is always external. I gave her a WTF look, thinking in my head what other ways one can be happy. That was back when my internal systems were in a mess. I thought about what she said a lot while going back home. I was so irritated that I couldn't find an answer to that dilemma. I canceled going to her for further session. I got what she meant many years later. Living in a different city, when I started experiencing joy within myself and feeling joyous for no reason, I remembered her and thanked her in my mind for giving me that jolt back then. Story 61. This is what suffering looks like. I am disabled and chronically ill and fighting every day to stay here, but people constantly need me to pretend to be upbeat and optimistic about it. When my therapist told me she saw me suffering, I broke down and acknowledged that I am fucking miserable at times, and that goes unnoticed. She went on to tell me to acknowledge its presence for myself, and whoa shit, is it ever better than that toxic positivity my friends and family keep looking for? I feel better. Story 62. Do you love yourself? Asked my therapist. I shifted uncomfortably in my seat. Well, if I got this project done or if I publish that book, then maybe, I said. You don't think you're worthy of love as you are right now? Me silent, afraid to say no because that's how I actually felt. Story 63, I have a few. If one of your loved ones had this problem, what would you tell them? Boom! Self-compassion unlocked. Another one is regarding buried traumatic memories. If you buried some shit in the yard, then later thought, Oh, I wonder what that was and dig it up. All you're going to find is some shit. Edit. I remembered another great one. Don't wait until you feel like yourself again so you can enjoy the things you used to enjoy. Do the things you used to enjoy until you feel like yourself again. Edit. Another one. I've been to a lot of therapy. No parent does a perfect job, so no parent does a complete job. Every adult needs to finish the job of parenting themselves. Story 64. It sounds to me like you are trying to convince yourself to stay with your girlfriend. I'm not so sure it should be so difficult. At the time he said this, I remember it was like he said, the earth is flat. I thought he was crazy when he suggested relationships don't need to be difficult. But in that moment, I realized I was trying to change myself in order to stay with this person rather than just being who I am. It took me three more months to finally break up with her. But from that day on, I vowed to myself to never again abandon myself just to be with someone I had convinced myself was better than me.